Hi, Misha here, and as I said in the lightning video, I probably would do a big Harrier overview again, looking this time at British Harriers, and we're going to go all the way from the initial GR1, talk about the GR3, then the C Harrier, the FRS Mark I, and then the F.A. Mark II. And then get into the second generation with the GR5. Then I have a GR7A. And then we'll end with the most advanced version. That really was cut down before its time. The GR9. The first couple of models are Corgi. And the others are Hobby Master. All are 172 scale die cast. So yeah, we'll just look at kind of how the jump jet evolved. And uh, it's a very historical aircraft. We will cover American service in another video. Well, let's just get into it. Like I said, this is a model of a GR1, very early, late 60s, early 70s vintage, and it's from Corgi. This is part of their Legends series. It means it has gear down, but uh, otherwise it's, it's a nice model for what it is. The uh, nozzles do rotate, the wheels do rotate, and it's predominantly all metal. And the, uh, the roots of the Harrier go back to the 1950s. As I mentioned in the lightning video, there was the infamous white paper, which uh, they tried to cut a bunch of that out of the bud budget by relying on air missiles. At the same time, Hawker Siddeley was looking for a replacement to their very successful Hunter. And then a new engine came along, the Pegasus, which allowed for variable thrust, uh, vectored thrust. And this would result in the first kind of prototype plan, the P-1127. And uh, the RAF was interested. They thought it would make a good reconnaissance aircraft, close air support, light, easy to handle from unfinished strips, they were interested by 1960, and even the U.S. was interested. So they would kind of have a proof of concept, and this would eventually evolve into what we know as the Hawker Sidley Kestrel, which uh, flew for the first time in 1964, and it used the Pegasus 5 engine. And from this after 1965, kind of looking at demonstrations, and they would build the uh, eight or nine Kestrels. It wasn't a full production, but it wasn't like it was just a single prototype. With uh, RAF interest, they would redesign it. They would update the Pegasus engine to the Pegasus 6 engine, known as the Mark 101, and this would go in the new version for the RAF. The first prototype of this flew in 66 and then the first kind of pre-production production model of the GR1 flew in December of 67. Known as the GR1, it was ground attack reconnaissance. This was not built to be a uh, fighter so, yeah, it uh, was, was for different purpose. And while they flirted with the idea of doing something supersonic in the 60s, they pretty much stuck with subsonic, which it is. So the specs on this were just under 47 feet long, and were pretty, pretty narrow. We have a, about a 25 and a half foot wingspan, or nearly 30 feet if you put on little uh, wingtip extensions that operated as uh, ferry tanks. That basically gave it about 10% more range 
if you need to. Of course, it has the very famous four positions that you can adjust. Now, many call this a, a VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, and it could do that. But it couldn't do that with its full payload. It could carry up about 5,000 pounds. It had a total of five hard points, one under the fuselage, two under each wing. And it could also carry two 30 millimeter cannon with about 100 rounds each. Alternatively, it could carry a reconnaissance pod. But if it wanted to get anything like its maximum capacity, it had to do a more conventional takeoff. It was more of a short takeoff. They would partially angle the exhaust and give it a short takeoff. It could still do a vertical landing, but even then pilots often like to do a short landing. It was just easier, safer. And of course a big thing was it often could mount two fuel tanks, one under each wing. Only the inner uh, hard points were plumbed, so you could not have four tanks, only two. Uh, yeah, so it was an interesting aircraft. It's subsonic. It could get up to about 730 miles per hour. It could go Mach 1 in a dive. And it had a maximum altitude of around uh, yeah, 45,000 feet. Throughout 1968, they kind of worked on the design, got production up. The RAF originally ordered 60. And the first ones were delivered at the beginning of 1969. And the first squadron was started to become ready by October of that year. And they would train in the UK. And then by 1970, they would station the first couple of squadrons in West Germany. And this would be up to three GR1s soon thereafter. And of course, this was a radically new aircraft. So um, they needed a trainer. This would become the two-seat T2. It had, of course, a longer nose than the GR1. It also had a longer section of the tail back here and a slightly taller tail fin to compensate for the extension. But it was fully combat capable. It could carry full stores and all that good stuff. It had good low speed, low altitude maneuverability. Of course, the short or vertical takeoff and landing gave it very good flexibility, and it could carry a wide range of stores for ground attack, um, iron bombs, rocket pods, things of that nature. Early on, it does not seem like it was wired to fire the AIM-9 Sidewinder, but after the U.S. got a hold of it as the AV-8A, it quickly showed that it could very much carry the Sidewinder with, with minimal modifications. But it really didn't have any air-to-air -air defense. In fact, it really didn't have much in the way of ECM or even a radar warning system at the beginning. It didn't have a radar itself, so it was a day, day fighter. And if you look, the canopy cockpit is pretty small had basically zero rear visibility. It was pretty cramped, kind of old school analog everything inside. It did have a zero zero ejection seat, which was kind of a requirement for this type of aircraft. Since the intakes are right beside the cockpit, it was extremely noisy and vibrations were noticeable. So comfort level flying it was not the best. This wing was a single piece, and it was designed specifically for subsonic lower altitude performance. Again, it was relatively maneuverable, all things, um, all things considered. They would build 61 of these initially, and then they would build, oh, 13 or so of the T2s. But soon, the GR... 1A would come along, and this was basically an uprated engine. It had the Pegasus 10 Mark 102 engine, which would just, you know, provided more thrust, which meant it could take off better with the full payload and was more reliable and safer for the pilot. They did do some new production, 
GR1As, I think 17. But most of them were upgrade GR1s, like 40 or so. They also would make a couple of new so-called T2As. But again, most would be conversions with the new engine installed. And then finally, kind of the ultimate version in this series that came about in the uh, mid-70s was the GR3. This had the Pegasus 11, the Mark 103 engine, yet again more thrust, more reliability. It had a slightly longer and reshaped nose to have a few more pieces of aviation kit, a few more electronics. It had a... Uh, AW, excuse me, an RWR, uh, a radar warning system. Had some basic ECM. And the cockpit was ever so slightly um, improved. But basic, you know, the, the, again, the, the whole deal, GR1, 1A3, was just improved versions of the Pegasus engine with a few bits of new kit thrown in for good measure. In the GR3, there would be some conversions, but the majority would be new production. They had like 62 GR3s, and at least 40 were uh, for new production. And to go with it, there was a new trainer called the T4, which they had, I think, 11 of. So, these, of course, were equipping the RAF. They were pretty prominently featured in West Germany in their 1977 Hawker Sidley became part of Brit British Aerospace BAE so later production ones would be made under that brand name but by this time the GR3 was out of production they were moving on to other things. The Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm Harrier, or rather Sea Harrier, FRS-1. Fighter Reconnaissance Strike Mark I. This model is also from Corgi, but it's part of their standard aviation archive collection. So, gear up or down, stand this one doesn't have ordnance, but it's, an, again, kind of an early generation one. And this had a very different use and different development. Going back to referencing other videos, like, for example, like I say in the Buccaneer. Already by 1960, the Navy was going through budget cuts. In 66, they decided to not go with the next generation of large fleet carriers. By 1970, they decided not to refit Eagle. And so, but they basically just had Ark Royal as a large carrier, and even it was scheduled to be retired. This would happen in 78, but the long and the short of it is they didn't have any aircraft to operate from it. The, the uh, Navy's Phantom, the uh, FG-1, needed Ark Royal. It couldn't operate from any other ship. So they were in a bit of a pickle. They didn't really want the Harrier, at least some in the Admiralty didn't. They were very insistent that their next aircraft, like the FG-1, be Mach 2 capable and a dogfighter and interceptor. Basically, they, they saw the F-14 that the Americans were developing, and that's what they wanted. Unfortunately, they didn't have the budget for it or the ships. In 1968... They basically had what they called through-deck carriers. Light carriers, escort carriers is what we call them. They later call these uh, command ships. But, um, yeah, we know them as the Invincible class. And uh, later on, they would be equipped with the ski ramp, which is pretty famous, also used by Russia. So they were getting a new generation. They were planning on having Invincible illustrious, and a new Ark Royal in this group, although Ark Royal would not be ready till 1985. 
and they didn't have a plane for it. Um, they, ju they just didn't have anything. Some in the Admiralty argued again for different performance, but in 1972 it came to their head. They had to do something. So finally in August, they reluctantly agreed to look into navalizing the GR-3, which was brand new at the time for the Royal Air Force. And that's exactly what Hawker Siddeley did. And in 1975, it was ordered. Initially, the order was for 24. Later, it was up to, to 34. The navalized version. This isn't a second generation. At most, maybe a 1.5. You, these would be all new production. They would still use the same basic Pegasus engine as the GR3, but it would be navalized, so more corrosion resistant. The wing was essentially uh, unchanged. It had a few minor tweaks to the surfaces, but same wing. However, the nose was where it was really different. From this point back, the intakes back, the ship is pretty much the same as the GR-3. But you get to the nose, and it's a pretty different plane. We have a new canopy. They raised it nearly a foot, so more of a bu bubble canopy. And originally, this was done to make room for more equipment, more displays for the pilot who would need them. But it also, of course, made it more ergonomic, more comfortable for him. Still pretty cramped, but better. And it gave him better side-to-side -side visibility. And restricted, but at least much better rear visibility. Moreover, it had an extended nose. And that was to house a radar. The uh, RAF's Harriers did not need or have a radar, but the... Sea Harrier needed one because they were expecting to intercept bombers over the ocean, and so they needed something. They ended up going with what was known as the Blue Fox radar. And uh, it wasn't a super advanced radar. It was actually kind of primitive by the standards of the 70s. It did not have look-down, shoot-down capability. But what it did have, it was lightweight compact, dependable, and affordable. So that's what they went with. And there are a few other things. For example, it had a slightly larger tail fin because of the longer nose, much like with the uh, T2. So, the uh, first prototype would fly in August of 1978. And the first production models were delivered towards the end of 1979 to the Navy. And they would begin training. And they were declared ready in 1981. Now, this was not really going to be used for a ground attack. This was to be more of a traditional fighter. To that end, they were originally equipped with the AIM-9B Sidewinder on a single um, pylon on the outboard. They could carry up to four, but usually they would have uh, fuel tanks because, you know, ocean range. They still retained the 30 mil cannon. And they could carry rocket pods and whatnot. They could also carry a reconnaissance pod or even a uh, nuclear weapon. That was the, the R and the S in the name. But the F was kind of the primary thing because these were meant to be uh, fleet defense patrol aircraft. That's what they got. And for training, they would have first acquire eight T-4s from the Air Force, naming them T-4AN. Later, they would get three new production T-4s, just called the T-4N. And these would not have radar, so for radar training, they actually had a special version of the Hunter called the T-8. And they were training up, and they were first on Invincible, later Illustrious, and then finally Ark Royal. And some would operate from uh, from land bases, too. And of course, now we come to the Falklands War. Kind of the 
the heyday for the Sea Harrier, which was just barely coming into service. Uh, they would deploy 28 of these in April in theater. And these would mostly be used as traditional air defense fighters. In May, they would be joined by 14 GR-3s. And these would be used primarily for close air support and ground attack. Interestingly, at least 10 of the GR-3s were very hastily refit to work from Royal Navy carriers. Kind of a harbinger of things to come 20 years later. So yeah, they would work together. The uh, Sea Harrier was credited with 23 kills. Most were aircraft. One was a helicopter. In the war, three GR-3s were lost and six FRS-1s. But most of the, the losses were from accidents, just mechanical failures, or a few from ground fire. It was actually a very successful aircraft going up against the Argentine aircraft there. So yeah, something that the Navy didn't want actually proved to be pretty successful. And would, uh, would give them quite a bit of service. The design of this was done under the Hawker Sidley name, but of course production was under the BAE name because it was after the merger when these started to be delivered. But the Falklands War did show some issues. Before we go here, just a note, it had basically the same specs as the... Uh, GR-3 speed and altitude and all that. Its main deal was it mostly carried AIM-9 sidewinders rather than ground attack equipment. And of course it had the radar and some other avionic differences. And these would use the ski ramp to take off. Quite interesting. One of the earliest improvements for the uh, Sea Harrier came right at the beginning of the Falklands War when the U.S. gave Britain the much advanced AIM 9L Sidewinder, which probably actually accounts for their success in that war, but it definitely showed shortcomings. Between 83 and 87, there were a few updates to the design, just kind of interim measures to try to you know, improve it. For example, it went to the double pylon on the outboard stations. They adopted a new uh, external drop tank. And then in 1987, they were equipped, much like the RAF's Buccaneers, to carry the new Seagull jet-powered anti-ship missile. Things of that nature. But, as early as 1983, Phase 2 was underway, and in 1985, BAE was given a contract to develop and produce this one, the FRS-2 Fighter Reconnaissance Strike Mark II. They were going to convert, update, rebuild 33 of the existing FRS-1s and do 18 new airframes, completely new builds. They would also acquire oh, a few T-8 trainers, two-seat trainers, and these are updates from the T-4N series. So what do we have with the FRS-2? Quite a few things. It went from the Pegasus Mark 104 navalized engine to the eh, somewhat improved Mark 106. This actually allowed a slightly higher top speed of about 735 miles per hour. It also had an increased payload, like the GR3 could carry about 5,000 pounds. The Sea Harrier could get up to nearly 8,000. It had the same double pylons for the AIM-9. Another huge jump forward. They carried the medium-range AIM-120 missile. They could carry up to four, although typically it would just carry the two inboard. Or you could have a fuel tank and the two outboard. You know, options. And this gave great capability. And to work with the new missile, 
and went to the Blue Vixen radar. The Blue Fox was economical and dependable, but kind of eh, old tech. The Blue Vixen for a naval single-seat fighter radar was actually quite advanced for the mid-80s. It had look-down, shoot-down capability and much improved range. It had more modes. And to go along with this, the cockpit was uh, reworked with more modern displays, making it a little easier for the pilot to get data and utilize it. They didn't really extend the wings, but they did reshape them, rework them a bit with the Mark II. A lot of little tweaks like that. It also got some new equipment. For example, it got a new RWR, some other defensive equipment. And it was updated to take more modern reconnaissance pods. And it got a new ejection seat. Actually, the new ejection seat was a little before the Mark II in the interim program, but it was a standard feature. You get the idea. The main thing was new radar and updated engine and the uh, AIM-120 missile. You could still carry iron bombs or rocket pods if needed. The prototype first flew in 1988, and deliveries started in 1990. First with rebuilds, and then new airframes started to come in. And these would continue. The last rebuild was delivered in 1997. And the last of the 18 new airframes was delivered like a day before Christmas in 1998. And uh, a British Aerospace called it a Christmas gift to the Royal Navy. And that was actually a very historic aircraft because it was the last true 100% British Harrier ever built. Something else to note. The name was changed from FRS-2 to FA-2. And there's actually a reason. FA stands for fighter attack. The R was dropped because while this could mount a recce pod, in over 10 years the Navy never did it. And the S for strike was dropped because even though originally it could carry a nuclear a tactical nuclear weapon, they never really did it in practice. And in 1991, after the Cold War was winding down, the uh, Sea Harrier was taken off the, the nuclear strike roll. So S was replaced with A, so it could provide close air support. But mainly it was just a fleet defense fighter. Now both the Mark I and Mark II would serve between 93 and 95 over Bosnia during the Balkans uh, conflict. The, uh, the, the first FA-2s would come in to active service in 94 so there would be a slow phase out in 93 there was kind of a famous incident where an frs-1 was shot down behind enemy lines the pilot safely ejected and an sas team bravely went in to rescue him rescued him but then their rescue was not available so actually the french came in and saved the day rescuing everyone so very interesting story and i've talked about it a couple of times in the french helicopter video but uh, yeah, it's probably the most famous incident there. And that would be the last time the, uh, really the FRS-1 would see active combat. Most would be updated to the uh, FA-2. The other, the few that weren't were retired. And uh, yeah, so by the late 90s, these were very much in the fleet. And they did not expect to retire them until at least 2012, maybe even 2018. But, the dreaded budget cut. In 2002, the government announced that they were going to be retiring the Sea Harrier. What to replace it, you might ask? Oh, the F-35B. It should be available any day now, so no worries. Of course, you know how that turned out, <clears throat> which would lead to a problem we're about to talk about. Anyway, between 2004 and 2006, the fleet of 50-some-odd FA-2s, along with their uh, T-8 trainers, were retired. Keep in mind that many of them weren't even a decade old, at least after the rebuild. 
pretty pretty sad honestly many would end up being uh given sold what have you to the uh to the u.s where they could be used for spare parts for the marines this was a very capable aircraft considering its uh performance the fact that it could carry four m20 or 100 excuse me aim 120s or two and then four sidewinders during the balkans they actually were updated with aim 9m sidewinders which were even more capable and they received some more modern equipment too like a gps system Again, this model is from Hobby Master. So, a little more features than the Corgi. It comes with a few different ordnance options and gear up or down, cockpit open, pilot removable. Very cool model. I was really glad when they did another uh, Sea Harrier. Early on, Hobby Master did a Sea Harrier. But otherwise, they've either do been doing uh, AV-8Bs or the GR 5, 7s, and 9s. So they have not done very many Sea Harriers. In fact, I can only think of three or four. And it is different. It is mostly a Generation 1, like the GR 1, GR 3, just with a few updates. Again, most in the nose. By the way, the FA2 was slightly longer with a, a taller tail fin than the one, again, to you know, accommodate the new radar and new equipment. But unfortunately, that was the end of the navalized Harrier. Really, it, it came too soon. It was still in its prime. But such are governments and budget cuts. But in the Royal Air Force, it had a bit more to do and say. Just a quick addendum to the Sea Harrier before we move on to the uh, Generation 2 RAFs. This one we've been looking at is called the Admiral's Barge. It was a release from Hobby Master last year. And it is of a purpose-built new airframe FA-2. In fact, this aircraft only served for a few years. It was introduced in 98 and was already out of service by 2004. So... And it has the very blue paint scheme, and of course it's in the uh, kind of air defense short range configuration with two AIM 120s and four AIM 9M Sidewinders. But this model recently came in. This is another Hobby Master. In fact, I think this was their first uh, Sea Harrier release. And this was originally an FRS-1 that was updated to FRS-2 slash FA-2. So this one served much longer, and it's in more of a traditional paint scheme. And it has the uh, underwing tanks. And it has an AIM-120 one on each of the outboard pylons which you know, is perfect fine they can uh, mount them anywhere in fact you could do four but i thought i would just show you since this one is uh, configured a little differently and since this is an upgrade from the one to the two not just a purpose-built two there's only a handful of small noticeable differences the model itself. The only difference, they have the same features. This one just comes with the ordnance you see here. The uh, newer release here comes with what you see, plus it also comes with uh, fuel tanks. So you get a little bit more option to configure this one, whereas this one just comes as you see it. Of course, you could always just pull off the missiles or the tanks and have it kind of stripped down and bare. For whatever reason, this is actually a tighter model. And by that, I mean the, the cockpit fits very 
tight and the engine nozzles are very tight with my uh, admiral's barge here the cockpit's a little little loose not the worst but and the uh, nozzles often want to kind of droop down on me especially if i move it around a lot it's not bad that they don't fall off they're meant to pivot it's just something to point out Alrighty, well, we'll get back to the main video. And now we come to the Harrier 2, the true second generation. This is also where America comes into it. As I said, the U.S. Marines purchased the AV-8A, which was basically a GR, GR-1. This would be updated to the AV-8C, at least most of the ones would. And these aircraft would be built in Britain. Although they were shipped over in parts and assembled in the USA. But as early as 1970, talks between Hawker Sidley and McDonnell Douglas were underway for either a joint project or for McDonnell Douglas to license produced. So McDonnell Douglas was interested. And between 1973 and 75, they really were talking about the next generation of Harriers to use the next generation of Pegasus engine known as the Pegasus 15. This is going to be a bigger, badder aircraft, more range, more payload, more capability. Budget cuts, yet again. <laughs> In 1975, the government essentially pulled funding. And so, Hawker Sidley had to pull out of the partnership, which you know, obviously it dissolved. And so, the Pegasus 15 was abandoned. Yet the RAF still needed a new Harrier. And the Marine Corps were still interested. And for a time, McDonnell Douglas kind of worked on a less ambitious second generation Harrier on its own. Namely having a bigger wing and being made out of lighter, more you know, composite materials and trying to upgrade the engine as best they could. They hit several political road bumps that I'll go into detail more when we do the U.S. Harrier part but needless to say there was a lot of pushback from many in the navy and then finally the carter administration said uh, they would only put it in the budget congress of course and if mcdonald douglas could get a partner on board a major foreign partner to help kind of pay for it and to buy it they didn't want to just build you know a hundred for the marine corps and that be it so at this time attitudes in the uk are changing an agreement is reached. Essentially, the RAF takes a look at the what's become known as the AV-8B in 1980, and they, they like it. They like what they see. They do say we need a few changes, mainly to do with making it a little bit more of a dogfighter, a little bit more maneuverable at low speeds, because the Marines, they didn't care. They, they won what has been referred to as a bomb truck. They were interested in the V-style performance and able to deliver a bunch of ordnance on target. So... Yeah. What the British agreed to do was pay for some of the total uh, development cost and to pay for most of the changes they would need for their version. And uh, McDonnell Douglas and now uh, BAE would uh, split production. So you know, th they wouldn't double up. Like one would produce the wing because it was still a single piece wing. One would produce the engine so on and so forth. So kind of a work share thing was developed. Between uh, 81, when the first true prototype flew, and 83 and 84, when it went into Marine Corps service, it's all kind of happening in the USA. The RAF picks up with their first prototype flying in 1985, and the first production, as it was known, GR-5, was delivered in late 1987, and the first squadron was declared operationally ready at the end of 1989. So what do we have here? Well, like I said, it's made from more composite material. It's actually a little bit shorter. It's closer to 46 feet long than 47, but it has a much bigger wing. It's over 30 feet wingspan. Has an uprated Pegasus engine with considerably more thrust. 
it went from 5 to 8 hard points, 3 under each wing, plus 2 under the fuselage. It could carry, of course, bombs, rocket pods, but it could also carry sidewinders and other things that were more advanced. Still didn't have a radar, but it did have more advanced equipment. The uh, cockpit is actually, at least the canopy, is kind of borrowed from the Sea Harrier. It's raised and more bubbly. Internally, it's a digital cockpit, kind of inspired by the FA-18 Hornet with more modern features there, and it was more designed to make the pilot not feel crazy. <laughs> so they made little changes like that. It could carry quite a bit more payload, eight to 10,000 pounds, depending on what you wanted to do. They went to a new cannon. Originally, the uh, first generation used a 30 millimeter. This has a rapid fire 25 millimeter, two of them. That's on the British version. The American version has a 25 millimeter Gatlin cannon. It's only one, but multi-barrel. So that was updated. Things of that nature. And the GR5 was really just the beginning. They would... Uh, originally agreed to order 60 to help with the program while well, they lied they actually ended up getting 62 so it yeah, fulfilled their part of the agreement and these are delivered in the uh, late 80s and into the very early 90s with final assembly being done in the UK by BAE and they were first stationed in 1990 in West Germany as interdictors they were not used in 1991's Gulf War, which remember was January. They were considered just too new, too untested. And to be fair, the GR-5 was not, he really wasn't fully capable yet, to be honest with you. One other thing, the larger wing, the heavier payload, it came at a cost. These were slower than the first generation. Like I said, the first generation was 730 to 735 miles per hour, depending on the version. This here was about 660 to 670 miles per hour top speed. So yeah, quite a bit uh, slower, about a 70 mile per hour loss. The Marines didn't care. The RAF cared, but not enough to complain because they at least were getting a new aircraft that they desperately needed. Even though these weren't used in Iraq in 1991, they did first go there to the Middle East in 1992, an operation that was highly unsuccessful to try to protect the Kurds from Saddam Hussein's wrath. They continued to serve there in 93 during uh, the whole no-fly zone thing. And by 94, 95, pretty much all of the Generation 1 Harriers were out of frontline service, letting the new... Uh, Generation 2's take over. But, the, uh, the GR-5 was really just an interim measure. It was almost a pre-production model. It was never fully combat capable and never fully rated with all the ordnance that they needed. No, that would fall to the GR-7. The GR-7... Specifically, this is a GR-7A. And I have this one kind of loaded out with a lot of ordnance. And if you notice, the tanks on this one over here are actually from that. I just stuck them on because this just comes with empty pylons. This GR-5 is actually the test model that flew. Normally, I like to get the loaded out ones. And they did have the West German interdictor version. I just thought, I have an armed version. I might need to get one. Not. And this really was just an interim solution to kind of test out the new wing, the new engine. But it wasn't really full, uh, fully capable. It didn't have everything ready, incorporated yet. For example, the, the last 20 or so builds were built as GR5As. And all that really meant is they altered the construction to make it easier to update to the GR7. The GR-7 here, the prototype first flew in November 
of 1989, so actually a month before the 5 went into full service. And the first GR7 was put into service in late summer of 1990. And they would do 34 new build GR7s, and of the 62 total GR5s, 58 would be updated GR7 standard. So basically all of the GR5s would be updated to this. That also means they had a fleet of over 90 of these. Pretty strong considering the climate at the time. So what's the big deal here? Well, we have quite a few new avionics. We have a new refueling probe here that's retractable. Earlier Harriers had a bolt-on probe, which is a pretty common thing in the British military, but now they've got a more elegant retractable probe over here. We have uh, new ECM equipment. We have a much wider range of weapons compatibility. And we have night vision capability. So this is much like the Marine Corps AV-8B+, since it can be used with night vision goggles. They even were thoughtful enough to go to a new ejection seat pattern so that the pilot would not be injured if ejected wearing night vision goggles. Very nice. Very nice. And it carried a full range of stores. In by 95, these were very much in service, operating over former Yugoslavia. In 94, they did an interesting test where they operated a GR-7 from a Royal Navy carrier. And this was good, because in 1998, GR-7s were actually stationed on board some Navy carriers, oper operating alongside their FA-2 cousins. And this would actually lead to a combined Harrier force, a joint Harrier force, of Royal Air Force and Royal Navies operating together. They would also get new equipment in 1998, like a laser designating pod. And they would be updated to carry the AIM-65 uh, Maverick air-to-surface guided missile, which they would soon get a chance to use. If you notice on the nose, it has um, these tusks, as they're called. This is for new equipment and everything. On the GR5, that was pretty much just empty up there, but on the 7, they're utilizing the space effectively. And about 30 would be updated to the GR7A, which had an upgrade Pegasus Mark 107 engine which had more thrust, more lift. Basically, it operated at hot and dry environments better. And just allowed it to carry even more payload. This is when it starts to bump up to about 10,000 pounds. These would be used over Kosovo in 1999. And next would be used during the opening days of the Second Iraq War in 2003 to support coalition forces. They would provide close air support, oftentimes operating right alongside American aircraft because the systems are so integrated, so similar. They would also be tasked with destroying uh, tanks, fuel trucks, uh, SCUD missile sites, weapons depots, so basically ground striking capability, but they would typically carry at least a couple of sidewinders on the wingtips for air defense. And they were of course, like most Terriers, well liked by the troops on the ground. and Had a very good combat record in Iraq. The next year, 2004, it would be first sent to Afghanistan, relieving American AV-8Bs there, and again providing close air support. That's mostly what they were there for in Afghanistan, 
because these could operate from forward bases, they would be on standby, and if they were needed, they could be called in to uh, give relief. In 2006, they became quite famous for providing a lot of rocket strikes to either take out uh, enemy strongholds dug into the mountains, or again, as I was saying, they were used for strikes and what have you. And in 2007, some Harriers started to receive a uh, advanced sniper pod as well. So they were really doing their best to keep these up to date. And they had a, a good combat record. As for training, they considered doing a British T.6 trainer for the new generation. But this wasn't really judged cost effective. So they just ended up buying 14 TAV-8Bs from the USA. Designated as a T-10. The only real difference between the American and the British one was that the British didn't make theirs fully combat capable. And uh, these were delivered in 1995. Now, as we said, the uh, FA-2 was retired prematurely in 2006, and the F-35B was nowhere in sight. So what they started doing, operating Royal Air Force aircraft from carriers, and in some instances even being flown by naval aviators. So this kind of just tightened the whole joint Harrier Strike Force further as they were really mingling because of that really short-sighted decision to retire the Sea Harrier before they had a, a real replacement on the ground. So they learned from this lesson, right? This uh, GR-7A is really probably one of my two favorites uh, here, the FA-2 being the other one. It's from Operation Telic, uh outside of Kandahar in Afghanistan during that crucial 2006-2007 period when this really helped efforts out a great deal. It's just neat. Comes with a lot of ordnance. But by 2006, the Harrier fleet was a bit of a hodgepodge. Different updates at different times. Yeah, most of the GR5s have been updated to GR7s, but we also have the 7As. We have some, some have been updated to take certain ordnance, others haven't. It was decided to have kind of a new standard. And this would become the GR9, as you, uh, as you see here. Now, these would not be new production aircraft, because they weren't really making new ones anymore. They would select 60 airframes to be updated. And most all of the 30 GR7As would be, would be selected, because of the an upgraded engine. So you about half would be GR9s and half GR9As. And this was really just a, a standardization. And so they could have all the same, uh, you know, components making maintenance a lot easier. They did go to a new central computer, a new data bus. They did update the cockpit. They did give more weapons compatibility. Again, they were using the Maverick missile. They would... Uh, do targeting pods. The reconnaissance pod is kind of an interesting story. The GR-5, like I said, wasn't fully ready, and so it could not carry a recce pod. The GR-3 had, so when the GR-7 was needed for reconnaissance, they had to take old pods for the GR-3s and kind of duct tape them and bondo them to the GR-7 to make them work, wire them up. It was, it was a, kind of a messy thing. With the GR-9, they made a new recce pod and, and standardized it. And these were used for reconnaissance, even in the in 2003, during the Second uh, Gulf War when it began. The uh, Harrier was used as reconnaissance, and this would continue. So yeah, the, the GR-9 was just a, mostly an internal update of components, systems, add new ECM, 
Still no radar though. And the very first updated airframe was delivered in late 2006. And the first one was delivered in theater in Afghanistan in January of 2007. And of the 60 airframes, they would kind of do them in batches. With the last ones delivered in 2009. So, yeah, the, uh, the GR-7 fleet was down below 30 at this point. Still, you know, out and about. And the GR-9s and GR-7s uh, served alongside each other at, at this time period. The GR-9 also started to be fitted for new ordnance that the 7 didn't. Now, on the model here, I've got four packs of uh, brimstone air-to-surface missiles. Each pack holds three small little projectiles. Many say this is a variant of the American Hellfire missile used by the Apache. It was certainly inspired by it, but in a lot of ways it's a, it's a much more advanced weapon. It's designed to be lightweight and smart and also to counter reactive armor. And the benefit is an aircraft can carry a lot of them. Um, like on this one, you know, you see a total of uh, 12. And it's only taking up four, uh, four hard points. And they're not very heavy. They're just a small, smart little missile designed to defeat tank armor, basically. And they were experimenting with these in 2008. And then they started to clear the aircraft to use them in 2009. Another item that they used is this here. This is the ASRAM Advanced Short Range Air Defense Missile used by the UK and Germany and others in Europe. Started to appear on the Typhoon. It's a very Analogous to the American AIM-9X Sidewinder, found on aircraft like the uh, Super Hornet and what have you. Just a, a new, more modern missile. And uh, so yeah, the GR-9 could start carrying these. Other aircraft like the Tornado F-3 did as well. Just had a missile laying around, so why not? And for training for the uh, GR-9, they would upgrade a few T-10s to become T-12 trainers. So all's right in the world. Yes, we've uh, updated it. We've had a we have a pretty high performance. We have a standard now. We're using truly modern ordnance. And it was said that the uh, Harrier would, would remain in RAS service until at least 2018. And it's operating off fleet carriers and doing a very good job. The uh, GR-7 would serve in Afghanistan until the summer of 2009, or then it would be pulled out. The uh, Harrier, when it came in in the 90s, the Harrier II, replaced some older aircraft like the Jaguar. And in return, ironically, it was actually replaced in Afghanistan by the Tornado, an older aircraft than it was. This is because, in all their wisdom, it was decided that one of them had to go, the Harrier or the Tornado, and they decided to retire the Harrier early, even though they had just finished up the GR-9 program. The Tornado would continue to serve on up until nearly today. They retired the last of them in 2018-2019. So yeah, the Harrier was starting to be drawn down. The remaining GR-7s were retired by 2010. The GR-9s would uh, go on their last cruise ending in November of that year. So they were taken off fleet carriers. Or I should say uh, through deck cruisers to be politically correct. <laughs> and the last GR9s were taken out of service in April of 2011. 
truly a shame, much like the FA2 pulled out early. And also much like the FA2 that was pulled out because, oh, the F-35 is just on the horizon. The Harrier was pulled out because, oh, the Eurofighter Typhoon is just on the horizon. Well, that was a little closer to the truth because it was starting to come in then. But it just, they, they, they were counting their chickens before their eggs hatched in these instances. Retiring an aircraft before it was ready. So again, it kind of left a gap. And it left them scrambling, especially in the Royal Navy, because the uh, F-80, excuse me, the F-35B was still far from ready to go. They were kind of SOL with the Harrier being retired. They never really did fully implement the brimstone on the uh, Harrier here, just testing and kind of unofficial field trials. Although it would start to be carried by the Tornado FGR-4, and uh, they would use them in 2011 with the whole Libyan thing. So it is a pretty effective missile, and it's achieved a lot of uh, interest outside of the Royal Kingdom. Such a shame. Was the Harrier perfect? Far from it. But it was a very capable aircraft, and it was really the only aircraft of its era to be a successful uh, stole, uh, V-stole, VTOL type. Nothing else was really successful. But, um, yeah, there you have it. They would end up selling about 72 surplus RAF Harriers to the, uh, to the Americans. The Marines did not buy them to use. Rather, they bought them just to have spare parts and maybe for training if it came down to it. But again, the, uh, GR9s were practically brand new, some of them anyway. But there you have it. Thus ended the, the career. On the other hand, you know, it did, uh, it did last for uh, nearly 40 years. It's not bad. Really, yeah, almost, yeah, almost 40 years. So, could be worse. This model is just neat. This is, this is, um, again, a Hobby Master, and this is pretty much the final configuration, final variant of the GR9. This isn't an A, it's just a 9. So it has the uh, Mark 106 engine. But it comes with several pieces of ordnance. I just thought having it loaded down with a buttload of brimstones would uh, kind of be fun. Kind of showing the point of these little missiles that you can carry a bunch of them without a huge weight penalty. So yeah, this is a 2009-2010 scheme here for retirement. And goes quite along nicely with the uh, GR-1 over here, which is pretty much an early 1969-1970 scheme. So, here you have it, my six British Harriers. I know that most people do little short 5-15 minute videos. And I think when you're just doing a model, that's fine. But I really like showing the evolution of things. And originally I was going to make this a two-parter, but I thought it's just, I don't know. It's neat to see how we go from the GR1 up to the GR9 with the Sea Harrier in there as well. But I did draw the line at including the three American ones that I have. We'll, we'll do that another time. Because it's really its own story. Of these, the um, ones over here I've had for some time. And you've seen them before. But the two corgis over here are new. Well, new to me. They were found... By Aikens when they were cleaning out their back room over Christmas. And uh, being a sucker for all things Harrier. 
I just couldn't say no. So, here they are. And I don't mind this one being wheels down. It's kind of neat to see the kind of the outriggers on the wings. How they uh, helps help stabilize it. It's got the tanks. I did add a couple of bombs. Why not? I do have the uh, the NASA one, the A V eight C. So I do have one with with gear up. And this Royal Navy one is just cool. I wanted a FRS one. And there are differences between it and the two. It's more in a reconnaissance mode here. Pretty pretty bare bones, pretty stripped down. It's pre Falklands War. Some over here I think it's neat having the GR5 is a test bed, but then the other two just fully kitted out. Really, really fun doing these. They all have nozzles that move. What's neat about the Corgi, they move together. So if you move one, all four, they're geared. The Hobby Master, they're actually independent, so you have to move them independently. But in most other ways, the Hobby Masters are nicer. Uh, more options and just generally speaking, a little nicer paint. But the Corgis are not shabby at all, especially for the lower price tag. But, um, yeah, I'm just kind of going at random through different RAF and Royal Navy aircraft. And, and so I show off my new Harriers and kind of do a revisit of these using the new camera. So what do you think? Which is, uh, which is your favorite? Or do you hate the Harrier because you're a communist? <laughs> no, cool aircraft. And I really like how these, I mean, they, they attack things, but they also save many lives on the ground by providing close air support. And they had a very interesting combat record in the Falklands. Actually, the Falklands are about the last time the, uh, the GR-3s saw real combat. Kind of interesting. Alrighty, folks, it's getting late, so I will let you go. Appreciate you hanging out with me for a bit here. Any questions or comments, please post them below. As always, I appreciate it. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.